Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Boost Your Biology podcast. Today, I am joined on the show with a former professional AFL footballer. He has a deep level of curiosity as it pertains to the digestive system and gut health overall. Marcus White, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me, Lucas. Awesome. So, Marcus, I usually like to start out the podcast with understanding my guest's journey a little bit better. How did you get so fascinated into optimizing human health? I actually love this question. So as you mentioned before, I was a professional athlete. So in that sort of realm, I was always trying to find a way to get an edge over the competition. As you can imagine, like strength and conditioning is just so good at the professional level now. How can you find ways to get better? So I used to be really big into nutrition and finding ways to find more energy or finding ways to manipulate my body weight so that I could run more Ks, that sort of thing. So that was where it started for me. Then obviously I only had a short three-year career in the system. And then I went into personal training after that because I just obviously loved that space. And when I was a personal trainer, that gave me the, obviously before it was all about me, now it was all about helping others. But what I found in personal training was that people would confide in me all their struggles, all the health struggles, psychological struggles, whatever it is. And I didn't, I had the tools exercise wise to maybe help them lose body fat or make them look a little bit better. But was I helping them be happier, have more energy, those sorts of things? And I wasn't able to do that. So I started to try and educate myself more. So I started doing different courses. I fell into the realms of gut health. I feel like in my personal training days, that was where it was building up. And I was really interested into it, interested in it. And I went to a institute called IIN. I forget exactly what the abbreviation is, but it did a course in gut health. And it was good, but it didn't quite teach me how to help people that had problems. It taught me why the problems were happening, but what do we do about them? And then like, so I saw, I took that knowledge, but I didn't know where to go from there. And then I met my, my now wife and she had, and when we were first together, I was personal training and she used to um, go to bed really early. And she used to say, Oh, I love that you go to bed early. Cause I was up early for clients. And then I found out the reason she goes to bed early is because she's in so much pain when she um, she gets to the end of the day. And I was like, Mm. you can't live like that. So from the knowledge I had, I tried to help her, but I wasn't able to get to the root cause of things. So we hired a a gut health professional, I would say. His name's Dave O'Brien. People might uh, know him on Instagram, but he was able to, we went through a, a protocol with him in 2020. And after that, I was blown away by the amount of information he had. And then I ended up asking him to mentor me on helping others. And that was where I learned a lot and I've been able to take his knowledge and be able to really make an impact on people's health. And then since then, I joined the Institute of Health. I'm sure Jake Carter so did some work under him. And I've also worked under Dr. Brian Walsh. He's another naturopath. You might know him as well. So studied under him a little bit. So yeah, that's and that sort of leads me here today, helping people get over their gastrointestinal issues. Yeah, and you're doing a fantastic job from the information you're providing now on Instagram. Like you're doing a great job at condensing complex ideas and and distilling that into simple takeaways, simple actionable tips and strategies for people to optimize their gut health. And you've got a you know very interesting background. I'd love to go back a little bit and look at the um, common issues that you saw people facing um, when you were a PT um, around like the, new, the the gut health, nutrition, like what were some of the issues that you saw people facing? Yeah, a big one and especially uh, I worked with a lot of females was constipation mm. and I still think it's not talked about a hell of a lot and I think a lot of females are dealing with it and obviously there's a few different things that can be coming into that obviously there's hormonal sides of things there's motility side of things so that's how quickly food's moving through your gastrointestinal system but then there's obviously things like bacterial dysbiosis or what we might call SIBO that could be causing those problems as well so I would see a lot of that which sort of sparked my interest in gastrointestinal health. I remember my sister was the first one who told me about SIBO. She saw an integrative doctor, must have been back in 2014, 15. So that sort of sparked my interest there. The other thing I used to see with people was just like a real lack of energy. 
And then the other thing was anxiety, depression, mental health complications. And then obviously information I would be reading would be around how obviously that gut to brain axis and how they interplay with each other. So the mental health side of things probably interested me more, which is interesting to think that I wanted to work on people's guts to try and help their mental frame. Yeah, it's it's interesting because we'll get into the links there between the the gut and the brain and the the mental health side of things and anxiety and depression. When it comes to constipation, this is obviously a it's a common issue. And maybe do you want to define like what is considered normal? Because some people would think that going to the toilet once every three days is normal. Yeah. So let's let's talk about that. It should be at least one to two times a day, mm. and you should feel satisfied. So a full evacuation. So mm. a lot of people, you're exactly right. And, and that's on the opposite side of that as well. Some people go five times a day and they mm. think that's normal, which is not normal. But yeah, a lot like normal is not having a day without a stool, stool passing through. Because what we've got to remember is it's a massive part of our detox pathways. So if we are, if that stool is sitting within the large intestine or the small intestine, that's got hormones in it. Hormones can then get recycled back through the liver. Then we start to see hormonal imbalance. We then got other toxins that could be bacterial byproducts, heavy metals getting pushed back through into the bloodstream. So if we're not able to pass our stool properly, we're obviously just manifesting more and more problems. Yeah, this is really important point to note. The fact that, yeah, some of these hormones can be recycled enterohepatically like back into circulation and build up of toxins which can lead to like skin disorders other autoimmune issues when it comes to the link there between constipation and i guess another area of health which is thyroid health uh, i'm sure you've seen quite a lot of this is like the hypothyroid condition which coincides with constipation do you want to discuss the links there Yes, a lot of the time people will, with hypothyroidism, will suffer from bloating, constipation as well. It's also what can happen is you need thyroid T3 for stomach acid production as well. So there's a massive link there between thyroid health and proper motility to be able to have food to be able to be digested properly and then also to be able to pass through the gastrointestinal tract at the right speeds. Because that's the other thing is, there's like this perfect speed that you want food moving through your body where you're actually able to uptake nutrients, but you also don't want it slow where obviously, as we've talked about, hormones are able to recirculate. So what about this, this term that's thrown around, which is leaky gut? I've had a few guests talk about it on my show. Did you want to maybe discuss, is it real? Yeah. And, and like, what are some of the common causes of leaky gut? Yeah, so it's definitely real. So what we tend to see with leaky gut, there's two different ways to describe leaky gut. So there's paracellular and transcellular. So transcellular is where we get like splitting of the epithelial cells, which line the gut lining. And then paracellular is where the cells have split away from each other. So there's Mm. certain proteins that hold the cells that line your gut together now if those proteins become lost all of a sudden particles such as food particles free radicals toxins are able to come through the gut lining at a rapid speed and they're not filtered and they're able to enter into the bloodstream so this is what tends to happen here is we then get higher amounts of immune response high inflammatory response now if we get things coming through into the bloodstream obviously that's a direct access to every other organ in the body so that's where the gut, like the gut really manifests in illnesses all over the body. Common things I see that create leaky gut, big one is stress. So it's chronic stress. And a lot of people don't actually realize that they're chronically stressed. I remember when I was a personal trainer, and you probably see this a bit, Lucas, like I was training twice a day, working long hours, wired as, and didn't think I was stressed. <laughs> when I look back at that person, wow, I was uh, manifesting so many poor health choices. And then, so there's stress is a big one. Medication. So a lot of people get headache or whatever it might be. They're hungover. They pop anti-inflammatories or Panadol quite a lot, um, which in studies now, I think they're using it in studies to actually create permeability so that they can study intestinal permeability. So that just shows they're not safeguard. I think a lot of people just think it's like having a lolly. They're not safeguard. 
the glidin and glyphosate partnership, which is glyphosate is a herbicide sprayed on vegetables, a lot of wheat products. So the natural process of glidin, so glidin is the protein in gluten. People don't know that. And glidin stimulates the, the intracellular tight junction proteins in your gut lining to open up the cells, if that makes sense. Mm. Now, and then glyphosate is obviously a herbicide, it's a toxin, and it actually kills off a lot of your microbiome, which obviously is going to have a, a massive impact on the balance of your gut. Mm. Yeah, some definite obvious key triggers for leaky gut there. Definitely some negative factors there. Obviously, alcohol we can throw into the picture yeah, as well. I could throw more in there. They're the ones that come to my mind. Yeah, there's, there's, there's definitely a lot. As far as looking at it clinically or from a patient perspective, how do you go about restoring optimal gut function? Like where do you start typically? I look, so starting off, we, I go from north to south. So mm. I spoke about stress being a big one. So I don't think you can do a gut protocol without addressing someone's stress levels because like I, I use an example a lot. If you need tyrosine, the amino acid for the intracellular tight junctions in your gut, but you also need tyrosine to make dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine. You also need tyrosine for your thyroid. If we're under high amounts of stress, this is just a good one good example, we need all that tyrosine going towards dopamine because that's the that's the priority. So a lot of the time, if we're undernourished and we're stressed, we're not getting enough in, then the gut is going to become secondary and we're going to get that degradation of the gut lining. That's just one example. So working on stress management is a big one. Then we look down, it's looking at how people actually eat. So do they chew their food properly? Are they in a stress state when they're eating? So if we're eating at our work desk, our body is probably in a fight or flight state. So priority is not digestion. Priority is like getting ourselves out of danger. Looking at how we're eating, are we chewing our food properly? Then we've got to look into are we, when we're at, again under a stress state, we don't produce enough stomach acid from the parietal cells in the stomach lining. So we've got to look at is this person got low stomach acid and how can we support that while we're moving through the rest of the gastrointestinal tract? And then I look at if I'm trying to repair the gut lining, we want to look for high amounts of amino acids. The gut lining is made up of type 1 collagen. And that's made up of amino acids, hydroxyproline, proline, arginine, glutamine, cysteine. So we've got to be making sure we're getting the foods that have a lot of those in there. So that's why I'm a big advocate for bone broth, slow cooked meats, because they're pre-digested. It's much easier for someone to be able to uptake the amino acids if they've got low stomach acid, if they're eating slow cooked meats. And then we look at things like if we've got an imbalance in the microbiome, we're not going to be able to make efficient amounts of butyrate maybe. So that's a short chain fatty acid. So we need bifidobacterium for that. If we have low bifidobacterium, maybe we're not making enough butyrate. So then we want to have, we might supplement with butyrate or supplement with zinc as well, or maybe B6, these sorts of vitamins that could be cofactors for building up the epithelial lining. Yeah, some great, great strategies and suggestions there. And obviously good understanding the physiology there. I'm glad you brought up stomach acid because this is oftentimes a topic of confusion for the average population when it comes to like reflux or heartburn. Yeah. Do you see that common? Like people are unsure, like whether or not stomach acid is high or low. Do you want to touch on that? Yeah, for sure. So look, it can be high and high histamine can um, cause high stomach acid because it plays on there's a H2 receptor in the stomach. But in saying that most of the time, the people I see, it's low stomach acid that's generally causing um, the, the reflux. So you get like a pressure within the stomach and then it comes like you get like little pockets of acid come up through the esophageal sphincter. And then obviously if you get that acid reflux, that feel, you're going to think it's high stomach acid. A lot of the time I see people end up going to the doctors and I was one of them. I was, when I, my first gut issue was stomach acid issues. So I went to the doctor. I didn't know. This was when I was uh, a lot younger. Went to the doctor. He gave me Nexium. Yeah. And my only interactions with doctors as a kid was antibiotics. Mm. So you'd know this, you have a script of antibiotics and then you're finished and then you move on. So he gave me a script for Nexium. 
I had it, I was fine, all good. And then I stopped having it and it came back worse. So anyway, so I went back to him and I said, oh, like this is worse. He said, oh, you got to keep having it. I said, I'm not having this for the rest of my life. I'm only in my early 20s. Yeah. I worked out how to like naturally help my stomach acid. I didn't get to the root cause of it, but what I tend to see with people is yes, they've got low stomach acid. They end up on these medications that are totally deplete stomach acid. So then if you've got no stomach acid, you then are going to struggle to break down proteins properly, going to struggle to take up amino acids and amino acids are the building blocks for everything. So if you're looking at hormonal dysregulation, <laughs> could be possibly looking at stomach acid issues, just a possibility. So a simple way to help that is apple cider vinegar and water can help with stomach acid. That's just simple. But you've got to, once you know someone's got low stomach acid, we've got to think that there's possibly damage to the paratel cells in the mm. operatial cells in the stomach lining. We've got to look at stress. And then we've got to look at a thing called H. pylori, which is a, an, an infection in this, which burrows into those paratial cells in the stomach lining. Yeah, it's uh, funny you mentioned that story, Marcus, because uh, we share that in common. I, mean, <laughs> I, I was also prescribed uh, Nexium or, or proton pump inhibitors from, a, I think I was 16 when I yeah. was first prescribed it. And my dad's a pharmacist and yeah. he owns a pharmacy and I thought I was the, the lucky child because I was like, oh, look at this. I get unlimited stomach acid blockers. Yeah. Um, and then I realized as well, like the downstream consequences of inhibiting stomach acid affecting nutrient absorption, leading to protein malabsorption, things yeah. like that, and putrefication, things like that. Exactly. Um, yeah. Let's touch on like probiotics because again, I'd, I'd imagine you get asked this quite a lot. Are they beneficial? What are your thoughts? When should they be used? Yeah, I th they're definitely beneficial. Mostly a transient effect though. Uh, I think the spore-based ones are probably having a bigger impact because they're able to actually get through the uh, gastric acid and be able to somewhat have more residency within the gastrointestinal tract. Generally, like your lactobacillus and your bacterium ones are quite transient. I think there's only about a 30% uptake, I think I've read. In saying that, they still that, that transit effect can still have great great impact uh, on people's health. Generally, I don't get people to have them if they've got some sort of bacterial dysbiosis, and this because sometimes it's not necessarily safeguard to have lactobacillus and bifidobacterium because they can be part of the yeah. mix of the problem. If that makes sense. So generally, the more safeguard ones are like Saccharomyces boulardii, Bacillus coagulans, Bacillus subtilis. You can get those in a bit of a mix, and they're generally pretty safeguard. And they help not just with bringing that bacteria in, they help modulate the other bacteria and try and bring balance to pathogenic strains. They can also, like some of the Bacillus strains, have an impact on your own vitamin C production. Saccharomyces boulardii helps with secretory IgA, which is an immunoglobulin. So they've got great benefits. It's just using them. When's the time to use them? Obviously, I'm a big proponent. Of, if you're having antibiotics, you should be having some sort of Saccharomyces boulardii or Bacillus strains with it. Here's a quick little message to all men listening in to today's show. Do you want to double your energy levels, boost motivation, and increase your focus? If so, you may be interested in my epic men's energy program I've recently launched called Limitless. Now, Limitless is an exclusive 12-week program for men who want to go from feeling tired, unmotivated, or burnt out to highly energetic, driven, and focused. Within the program, I will analyze your own unique biology and lay out a fully personalized health protocol so that you can finally unlock peak physical and cognitive performance. Over the 12 weeks, you will have direct access to me to ensure your results, as well as the chance to join me live twice a week to ask me anything relating to health protocols and discover cutting edge men's health info to keep you at the top of your game. Now, spots in this program are extremely limited. So if you're interested in finding out more, make sure you go to bit.ly, that's B I T dot l y forward slash limitless program to reserve the next available call to see if you're a good fit that's b i t dot l y forward slash limitless program 
You'll also find this link in my bio on my Instagram profile and also my YouTube channel. I'm also, I also take the exact same approach. I think they can be used <clears throat> therapeutically. It's just a matter of selecting the right one. Maybe you have one that's an ongoing basis as like a maintenance thing. And then another one, if you've had severe food poisoning or antibiotic exposure, exactly, yeah. there's a time and place for them. Yeah. And also in saying that is the, the epigenetic reprogramming, the fact that some of these can reprogram the gut and up increase certain genes and decrease yeah. certain, they can be very effective. It's just a matter of knowing when and how to use them. Yeah. So what about another complaint I'm sure you've seen a lot of is in terms of post viral fatigue. I'm not going to mention the C word on here, but <laughs> did you want to maybe talk about what issues are people facing post virus? Mm -hmm. um, and, and how are you going about reigniting and restoring their energy? Yeah, I, to be honest, I haven't worked with someone. What they're tending to find is people with the long V is is there's a lack of lactobacillus, sorry, not lactobacillus, bifidobacterium within the gut. So a lot of the time what people are using, practitioners are using is bifidobacterium and the specific one is bifidobacterium long U. So that's been the big player in that sort of space from what I've seen, but I haven't worked with someone personally yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I've, you've I, found more in that. Yeah, I think like from the post viral fatigue, the approach that I take is in terms of like just really dialing in and restoring mitochondrial function. A lot of the supportive nutrients and carnitine, yeah. coenzyme Q10, yeah, D ribose, creatine, like these are the compounds that can help to, yeah, NMN as well is another one, like a bit Stand of a mitochondria up. blend, a mitochondrial cocktail. Let's yeah. go, let's go. Friday drinks, mitochondrial yeah. cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> the mito, cheers for the do you know? Do you know if there's, look, at, like I haven't looked into it, if you know there's like specific evidence around impact on mitochondria? It would be through like impacting oxidative stress and even potentially oh, okay. affecting like maybe the some part of the Krebs cycle or yeah. lactate dehydrogenase. I, I, I'd imagine it would interfere. We're learning so much about like the consequences that it can have. Yeah. There's a number of people that come to me and they're like, oh, like since I had the virus, like I haven't been able to, I just don't have the same level of energy yeah. or they have like this lingering like brain fog. Yeah. Um, and what I found is really effective for that is intravenous vitamin C. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So IV vitamin C was really powerful in, in restoring like, because it's so potently good for the immune system and yeah. good for the you know, that antioxidant effect, that's what I was going to say. So glutathione would be, yeah, awesome. Yeah. What about as far as what you've seen as in terms of some success stories as far as reversing bizarre conditions? Like maybe somebody's come to you and they've said, oh, hey, Marcus, like I'm struggling with this. And then you decided to approach it from the gut health and then all of a sudden yeah. their symptoms went away. So do you have an experience with that? I've got a couple. I've got one who I'm working with at the moment, which is pretty phenomenal. She came to me with like with a few different health complications but the big one was she was waking up in the middle of the night with these surges and no one could put a finger on it so she would wake up at 3 a.m she said it was a time and it would feel like she's gonna die or she get she felt like her body was getting stung and that her brain felt like it was fizzing and wow I know. Yeah. So she was going from specialist to specialist, no real answers. So she also had a few hormonal imbalances, but they were pretty easily cleared up um, with a few different lifestyle things. But I, what we ended up like working on was possible mast cell dysregulation. So I just started to lower a lot of histamine in her, di in her diet. Went, I don't know if you've looked into like the mast cell 360 so it has to be a little bit pretty restrictive with her food, but she had a lot of bacterial dysbiosis as well. We did a lot of like gut healing. We tried to lower histamine and mast cell activation. And now it was only a few days ago, she said, oh, I slept for 14 hours. And I was like, wow. So wow. that was, yeah. So she's pretty uh, amazed at the moment. I don't look, I don't believe in staying on a restrictive diet forever there's a root cause there and i think we'll find that as we work further into her gut we'll be able to lower her baseline of histamine production she's got i don't know we can talk a little bit into this but like high amounts of gram negative 
bacterial overgrowth, which is going to cause high amounts of lipopolysaccharide in her system. So there are a lot of the root causes I want to work at, but and we're getting there. But for, for her to be able to sleep properly was quite phenomenal, just with like nutritional lifestyle supplementation changes. And the next one was a woman who, when I first started working with her, I like to go through people's training schedules with them as well. She was very resistant against me giving her any sort of training recommendations because she her body's in so much pain. So she has such bad arthritis in her hips and other joints around the body, but the hips were the big one. Mm. Anyway, we went through full protocols, tended to find she, she had small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and severe intestinal permeability. There may have been a few other things there, but they're the ones off the top of my head. So we went through a few protocol, a big protocol. It was a pretty tough one for her, but she really worked through it with me. And by the time, just about four weeks out from the end, she had zero pain in her body. So she'd gone from, she used to be able to not exercise. Now she can go for hikes. She said her son lives in Byron Bay. She was able to drive. She used to not be able to be in the car for long because she couldn't get out of the car because her hips were so bad. But now she drove all the way to Byron Bay with no problem. Yeah. And that probably just comes back to just probably high amounts of inflammation, high amounts of pro-inflammatory proteins creating in, the, in those joints, creating problems. And as we reduce that load within the gut, we're reducing that load throughout the whole body. And then, because a lot of the time people think with arthritis and these inflammatory conditions, they just think it's from overuse of the joint. No. But a lot of the time it's not mechanical, it's biochemical. Yep. That's, that's incredible. And yeah, there's, it's definitely, you've just proven, like be proven really that the fact that we, if you address the gut, take a holistic approach, then it can actually you know, remedy some of the symptoms that people are struggling with, particularly the histamine related disorder, the mast cell activation syndrome, which is a sneaky one. Not everyone, yeah. not, no one really talks about that one, but it's, yeah, it's yeah. pretty common. 100%. Yeah. It's, and look, I, I never like to say anything is everything. People like to say one diet is everything or one, but the one thing is like when you're working on the gut, because it's so important for nutrient uptake and it's that barrier that protects a lot of the other organs in the body. If you can have a healthy barrier to every other organ, they're generally going to work pretty well. By working on it, you're working on a high amount of the body, like a protecting a high amount of the body. If that makes sense. Yeah. When it comes to diagnostic testing and or like determining SIBO, for example, you mentioned before, how do you go about that? Do you look at blood work or do you, do you get them to do specific tests, things like that? Yeah, I generally work with just blood work because it's just the, it's the cheapest and easiest. I sometimes work with stool. Depending on where people are at financially, they might want to look into that. They might like to see that, but I'm happy just to work with, with blood work. Uh, a lot of people obviously use breath testing and stuff like that. Obviously, the accuracy is up for debate with those sorts of things. Same with stools. Like they've, got, they've got their, let's be honest, every test has their downfall. So I generally work with just blood and stool. That's generally my point of call. And then, yeah, diagnosing SIBO, we're just looking for certain things like nutrient deficiencies. We might see issues with bile flow. So we might see bilirubin possibly out of whack. We might see MCV out of whack, those sorts of things. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned bile flow. <clears throat> for some reason, I always forget that bile is, it's part of the gut health picture. And I'm just like, oh yeah, that's right. Bile is really important for this and this and all these different pathways. <laughs> So like when it comes to like bile, optimizing one's bile production or the quality of their bile, like how do you go about doing that? Do you focus on like bitter foods, specific supplements? What's your approach there? Yeah. So my approach is like the big one is like obviously your liver and then obviously adequate fats. So there's that cycle needing, you need fats to create cholesterol, to create bile. You need bile to emulsify fat. So we need to be able to, we need to be able to, have the adequate amount of fats, but we also need the liver not to be overburdened too. I generally find if you've got gut issues, so if you've got bacterial problems and you've got high amounts of bacterial endotoxins in the system, that's going to overload the liver, possibly have an impact on bile production. And then we're going to struggle with bile flow. A lot of the time for stimulation of bile, I'll go for, yeah, you're right, bitter foods, something like rocket, radish, those sorts of things, even Swedish bitters before meals. So I have that in water 
So I generally use with clients, Swedish bitters or apple cider vinegar, depending on what's going on with their digestion. The other one I know that you love is using Tudka. So mm-hmm. if, if people need that support, I'll generally use Tudka because the other thing with bile is it's a natural antimicrobial in the small intestine. For people who don't know, it comes up through the duodenum, which is a top section of the small intestine, and then flows right through and keeps all your microbiome in check. So lack of bile flow is a breeding ground for bacterial overgrowth. Yeah, really great points you mentioned there because that's um, often neglected. I think people just underestimate the impact that bile could have on like gut health, but then also thyroid health as well. Like it's somehow like a tease up and links in there. What about as far as if you were to look at what does perfect gut health in the eyes of Marcus White look like to you? <laughs> oh, this is a good one. Perfect gut health. So it's a hard one because like you can have so many different symptoms within the body, but let's let, if we say it should, if we just talk about the gastrointestinal tract, it should run seamlessly. Like there shouldn't be any bloating. We should pass a stool every day. That Mm -hmm. stool should be like a long sausage, shouldn't be strained to come out. So there should be moisture. That's the other thing we haven't mentioned is like hydration, how important that is. We shouldn't have any unprocessed food within the stool. Then if we look at practices, like we should be very connected to our meals. So something we haven't mentioned also is being that connecting to your meals and smelling your meals creates saliva and that what's the stage, the first stage of digestion. Even though I'm going blank, it's not, <laughs> not cephalic. It's yeah, no, cephalic, cephalic is, is cephalic? Must, yeah, cephalic is where we create like that, the salivary, yeah, salivary enzymes. I'm, I could have missed something, but I'm pretty sure it's the cephalic. That's where it we is, create. It is, it is. Yeah, yeah. It is, it is. Yeah. Thought so. so when we smell food and connect to food, we create uh, saliva and salivary enzymes. So we start breaking down food already. I found it quite interesting with this one, like my son eating meat, like he doesn't, he's still getting used to chewing his food properly. And like it sits in his mouth for so long when he has meat. But I took, he had some meat come out of his mouth the other day and it was so broken down. And he like, and I couldn't believe it. Then that would be most likely just from it sitting in his mouth in those salivary enzymes. This is a, this is a whole other area I was hoping to bring up on the podcast is we can talk about a little bit about infant is infant nutrition or because there's, there'd be a bunch of listeners on the show who have maybe have young kids or planning to have kids as far as infant nutrition. Yeah. Let's look at that. Like I've, I've had a look at some of the food that you feed little Leo, Leo and it's phenomenal. Yeah. Like he's getting the highest quality food. So let's go like, how do you go about structuring his nutrition? Yeah, it's interesting. We probably should have, probably should get my wife, Bal, on here. She could probably speak for hours on this. But we've just tried to, we're very big on being instinctive with him in the sense of we offer the right foods. We don't give him any sort of confectionery or anything like that. We offer him meat, vegetables, high quality, of the highest quality. And then we let him choose what he's going to eat at that period of time. Now, what can tend to happen is, Say if I might have one day where we offer him red meat, sweet potato, and a little bit of rice, just an example. He might just eat the rice that day and he might not eat the meat and I'll eat the meat. But then you'll have another day where he will eat all the meat and not eat the rice. So it's almost like because they're still primitive in a sense, they know exactly what their body needs and they'll choose what they need to eat as long as you don't offer them those high palatable foods. Yeah. Yeah, so if you're giving them full uh, whole foods, you'll generally see that they will choose different options each day for what they need. So some days he won't eat liver. He won't want to touch it. But then other days he'll eat a lot of it. And I don't know if that's cellular communication to his brain saying, I need more vitamin A. I need more iron. I don't, we don't know, but that's what we generally try and do. So we're bit, like, we're very big on don't offer them the high palatable food, especially at a young age, because that's all they'll go for. And you, their taste buds will be dominated by sweet, yeah, or salty. And then all of a sudden you're, you're going to struggle because people say, oh, my kids are so fussy. They won't be fussy. <laughs> they won't be fussy if all they've got is whole foods. And otherwise they'll go hungry. And oh, trust me, a human will not go hungry. <laughs> yeah, some good points there. And actually something that came up in my mind there was we do blood testing for adults, right? Like yeah. to look at 
nutrient deficiencies. Does anyone do blood testing for, for the kids, like to assess vitamin status and things like that? They do, but generally only if they're ill. So we're okay. me and myself and Bal right now are working with a young child at the moment who's struggling a little bit. So I've had a look at some kids' bloods. The only thing is because they don't understand what they're doing, it can be a little bit traumatic. So yeah. coming someone with a white coat, putting a needle in them, if you can't communicate with them and make them feel safe, it's not. I don't know if it's the best thing to do, in my opinion. But in saying that, if someone, if the kid is ill or there's something not going right, I, the first thing I would look at is their bloods. Yeah, yeah. Geez, that worries me in the future with my own, with yeah. my, own my own kids. <laughs> you're gonna be wanting to look into everything. I'm gonna be like, you're Superman, baby. I want you to take the blood. <laughs> I want you to be elite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't say you'd be like trying to look up and say, nah, testosterone's not optimal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna start ice. Start ice and those yeah. balls. Yeah, he wakes up and you've got ice in his bed. <laughs> How is this? Oh, geez. Oh uh, protein pout, protein shake from the get-go as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he gets a little bit of goat's whey in there. We make him a smoothie with goat's whey. Nice. Yeah, he has his little smoothie. We always sneak some like liver into his liver capsules into his smoothie. That's handy. I love that. Yeah. Just spiking his his food with uh, nutrient dense items. 100%. We've only got, the way we see it, we've only got a certain amount of time we're wearing control and then he's got to go out into the world and make his own choices. And that, that happens very, like he's going to go to parties. We're not the sort of, we want to be able to educate him so he can make decisions. We don't want to be always telling him no. Obviously, he's going to want to eat poor quality food at some stage and we can't stop that. But if we can educate him, then he'll generally, hopefully he'll make better decisions himself as he gets older. Some. Something we can talk about is like the peer pressure for the age group of let's say seventeen to twenty-one. Or yeah. It could even be it could even be younger these days. I I can't remember what it's like to be fifteen, sixteen, well, but like even know. old, even older, like with drinking. You think you're weird if you don't drink. How did you ever go through a phase where like people would judge you for not drinking at all? Or yeah, because I was a wanted to be. I was an aspiring AFL footballer, teenager. I never drank really at all. So. I would always cop flack for it. And I, I understand now, but I didn't at the time, is people are just insecure and about the fact that you're doing something that probably they should be doing. Do you yeah. know? So that's projection. projection. Exactly right. Exactly right. So I definitely copped it a little bit, but I probably made up for it after my football career was over, to be honest, yeah. a little for a few years there. Yeah, I can relate to that as well. And I, I played soccer as well for a number of years, like semi-professionally and... I always use that as the excuse for not drinking. Yeah. But really deep down, I was like, I'm actually just not keen to drink. I was never, ever keen to drink. And I was just like, I never felt good when I, the day after or even that night, I just felt mentally not even that good. Like I just didn't feel that good when I drank. Nah, yeah, it's, I feel exactly the same as you. Like even now, if I have one drink, I notice that I'm not as good a dad. It's not as good a father to Leo the next day. Just one drink and I'm not as patient. And I'm like, I don't want, I don't even, it's not worth it to me to have it to be like that. I r- really respect that level of self-awareness that you have to even be consciously aware that like your, the quality of your health is now impacting people around you. To have that level of awareness is important because I'd say 95% of the population would not make that connection. No. And they'd just be, Yeah. Well, if it happens all the time, and the other thing with, and you would know this, when you're constantly analyzing your own health, when you're optimal, right? and then when you're not, and if you do something that, po- let's be honest, alcohol is a poison. If you do something that poisons you, and then the next day you're not optimal, you know why. <laughs> oh, hundred percent. When I, at naturopathy, when I studied naturopathy at a university, they were surrounded by people who are always analyzing their health and it can get to a degree can become the, you can go to the other side which is like orthorexia which is like 100% hyper analytical of your state of health I definitely went through a phase like that but I'm on the other side I'm not on the other side now but I'm just like I have all that information I went through that phase I learned so much I learned a shit ton about my physiology and biology through experiments and tracking and then now I'm like minimalism like I just don't need to do as much because I know I've done my learnings 
yeah, what it comes back to a little bit is feel. Like in the end, like I say to talk to clients and clients be like, so do we do blood? Do we do stool at the end of it? I'm like, we can, but what do I care about? I care about how you feel. Is your digestion good? Are you happy? Is your energy good? I don't need a lab to tell me if you're healthy. If everything's working optimally, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah, yeah. I definitely explain the same thing as well. It's like subjective feeling. Marcus, my final question for you is if you were to like give my audience or listeners one really crucial bit of advice when it comes to healing and or optimizing their health, what would you tell them? (laughs) One bit of advice. Eat me. (laughs) That's one thing I've got to, I feel like I've got to tell people just because they like the, there's such a big push for veganism, but a big thing is I'm big on is stress management. Like I think there's a lot of nutrient nutrition advice around. I would say, make sure you do eat meat and try and eat liver and stuff like that. But the big one that people I think are missing is they're doing everything. They're exercising, they're, they're eating well, they're doing everything like that but they're not managing their stress and they're not aware of it either. So just analyze your life, how much you're doing each day. Analyze, have you got any sort of um, uh, stress mitigators to put into your life and and start to analyze that because the stress response is the priority access in the body. So if we're chronically stressed, other systems have to get depleted and we want to nourish every system in the body. Yeah, I think that's great feedback, great advice for my listeners. But yeah, Marcus, thanks so much for coming on the show. Where can my audience uh, connect with you if they want to um, learn more? Yeah, so my Instagram is Life Athlete Health, and then hopefully I'll start to. I've got a TikTok that I'll try and get going. But please, if you want to get in touch with me, Life Athlete Health, send me a message. Be glad to connect. Awesome, awesome, great stuff as always, Marcus. Yeah, we'll be in touch. Thanks very much, Lucas. See ya. Awesome. Bye.